Uh, this is Dr. Sederberg. She uh, uh, has a yeah, PhD in started. theoretical physics and now tries to figure out how neurons talk to one another, visualizing that. In the old days, if you could get one neuron <laughs> to signal, it was fantastic. And now she's looking at thousands. All right. Great. Well, I'm really excited to um, be here and talk to you all today. Uh, but before I get to my um, research, I just wanted to say a few words about my path to get here. I'm actually from Duluth, Minnesota. So for those of you who spent two hours on a bus getting down here this morning, <laughs> I've been in your seat. <laughs> um, and if you'd asked me what my dream job was as a high school student, I would have had no idea. I was interested in many different things um, and, well, possibly still am. But um, I went to college. I chose a, a pretty small college that has um, only STEM fields. It's a liberal arts college, but you, you know, it's engineering, science, and math. And it was a wonderful environment for me because there was just a very um, solid community around thinking about technological problems and scientific problems, but considering its impact on society. And that's, you know, very important, I think, for anybody considering going into engineering and math is what impact will your work have? Um, there is a nice little uh, space to fill in barriers overcome under undergraduate, which I noticed was not on graduate or early career or current. Um, so, you know, the sad news is there will be barriers <laughs> at all stages. But at least in undergrad, you know, there I was certainly homesick. Now it seems very silly, but after three months of only sunny weather. I thought I was going to go crazy. I was in California. Um, so I guess Minnesota is <laughs> welcoming me back with actual November <laughs> now. Um, and I ended up studying physics. I thought I would be a theoretical physicist and do um, string theory, which is a esoteric branch of theoretical physics, you know, concerned with fundamentals of the universe. And at one point, I, I guess I veered off that path to understand instead what are you know the fundamentals of the brain. Um, possibly just as interesting. And with the advantage that we have these amazing technological tools now to really get at these questions. Um, so I went to grad school at, at Princeton and then postdoctoral fellowships in Chicago. And then I spent five years in Atlanta. And um, after this <laughs> very long odyssey around the United States, I started my lab back at the University of Minnesota about a year ago. And with that, I will get into um, the work that I do. So it might be a little disappointing. I'm not actually going to talk about language. This is a, a metaphor so for how we try to understand you know, collective patterns of activity across large populations of neurons. And just to give you a visual for this, the scale of the problem, um, you know, the human brain you know, in this cartoon is you know, about 15 centimeters. Um, on the right, I'm showing a, an image of about 2,000 neurons. These are measured using a technique called two-photon calcium imaging. And essentially what this reflects is what is the level of activity in an individual neuron as a function of time, as in this case, it's in, in a mouse. So it's as a mouse is performing some sort of task. You can look at, um, you can use this in different parts of the brain to see how different parts of the brain are, you know, are drawn into different functions. Um, but pay attention to the scale bar here. You know, this field of view is maybe 500 microns across. What this means is, you know, any fMRI signal from a human brain, any MEG or EEG recording is giving you really valuable information about how a human brain works. But at this fine spatial level underlying it, you have thousands of neurons acting in concert together, interacting. Um, it's a very complex problem. So what are the kinds of questions that we ask? And I want to kind of go with this metaphor of language because sometimes mathematical models can be a little bit, you know, dry <laughs> to explain. Um, so the first question might be, if you're studying a language, what are the grammatical rules? How do you put words together in the proper order to convey meaning? Similarly, in neural activity, how, 
how are dynamics across large populations organized? How are they organized across different brain areas? Um, drilling down a little deeper, what are the words of neural activity? So when you can read out the activity of every single neuron in a local area, you can very precisely decode what information is represented in that pattern. This is not dissimilar from you know, looking at words in you know, a, a book in a foreign language that you don't know and trying to decode you know, what does that particular word mean? How does it relate to something in the outside world or an idea? Um, and then drilling down even deeper, what are the letters? How do you put together letters that, that form a word? Now, in, you know, in, in English, there will be certain combinations of letters that come together more often than others. So, you know, TH is much more common than, say, TQ. And statistically, you can write down models that capture those relationships. Similarly, you can do that for cells. You can also look at individual cells as you know, what is their particular cell type? What kind of cell is it? At a very gross level, we've known for a long time that there are excitatory neurons, which have a, an impact on downstream cells that causes them to be more active, and inhibitory neurons, which can shut down activity. But now, we have far more fine-grained views of the particular individual cells. So let me put some, you know, more specific biological pictures to this. Um, this plot on the, the right here with all the, well, the one on the left, but on the right side of the screen, with all, all the colors um, is showing a representation of patterns of gene expression across individual cells. So at this resolution, you may not be able to see it, but this is actually a scatter plot, a dot plot of about 20,000 neurons. And they've been clustered according to similar patterns of gene expression. And these different groups of cells are neurons that really have different types. They, they act in different ways. They connect to other cells in specific ways. On the right, um, what this diagram is showing is that there are particular patterns of connections between neurons. We can characterize them statistically. We can look at you know, single pairs of, of neurons in a brain. But to actually put this all together and understand what kinds of activity patterns you see is a really challenging problem. So fundamentally, what I work on is how do you connect structure, how do you connect these structural details up to patterns of activity across large populations of neurons? Um, just to say a few words about this, this is a, an image of about 30 minutes of spontaneous activity in 3,000 neurons, recorded in a mouse, not in a human. It's not technologically feasible to do this in humans. <laughs> but um, something, these, these neurons, so each, each row in this image is a single neuron, and the rows have been sorted to put neurons that are highly correlated with each other together. So what you can see is that, one, if you just added up everything and you don't have this delineation between specific neurons, you'd be losing a lot of the patterns that are there. Um, and two, you know, not every neuron is off doing its own thing. There are these, these simpler patterns that are apparent across large groups of cells. And so how do we go about this, you know, being able to look at a circuit in terms of, you know, what are its patterns of connectivity, what are the cells that make it that make it up to, and like what are the important details of that? What aspects of that are actually important to governing these patterns of spiking activity that we can observe in local populations? And this is where we have, you know, a very strong role for computational models. So we can use models to really test our intuition for what impact specific network structure will have on dynamics. Um, it, you can make your model more and more complicated and see how that changes the emergent um, properties of activity. You can also use modeling, we also use modeling approaches to understand and interpret the patterns in the, the network dynamics that we observe and to glean from that information about how the brain works. Um, and so, you know, clearly today we don't have time to um, derive these equations, but what I can show you is what are the kinds of activity patterns that come out of this equation. This equation might look a little bit you know, yucky and, and complicated. The, 
but the number of terms in it is extremely small compared to, you know, 3,000 neurons, right? There's you know, a term there with three different letters in it, term there with, you know, four or so. Okay, so each of those is a different parameter that we have to determine and control and d decide how it's going to evolve. But there's maybe 10 decisions that we put into this model. How close can we get to understanding what thousands of neurons are doing? This is an image of spiking activity generated under this model. Now, of course, it looks a little bit you know, noisy and not very organized, but we can analyze it in the same way that the you know, brain activity from the mouse brain was analyzed. And when you start to cluster things, you can see that, yeah, there are groups of neurons. This model can explain why you have groups of coactive neurons. Of course, looks like the data is not a very precise way of comparing, but we can develop better and more precise comparisons of the structure in our model versus structure in real life. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to find is what is the right grammar that we need in this model to understand the structures that unfold in data. Um, and you know, why do we care about all of this from a medical perspective? Now, when you consider that like um, the activity patterns underlying the finest resolution measurements that you can make in a human brain probably comprise thousands or tens of thousands of neurons. We would really like to be able to write down a simpler model to really understand what are the important features and how can we ever hope to control them. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, um, thank my lab and co-authors and past collaborators, and I think these slides are available online, or at least the video is. So if you're interested, there's some references for further reading as well. Right. So, you know, the first step really is understanding what is a, a normal structure. You know, what, what do you expect to observe in functioning in a, a, a network that is not suffering from a, a disorder? Um, but once you have that understanding, you have a simpler way of, of describing really the physics of the system, um, the degrees of freedom and how you can move those around. So perhaps we could identify low dimensional structure or you know, a simple underlying factor that would be important for Dr. Widge's lab to target in a particular um, experiment. Or you know, in the rare cases where you do have recordings from small numbers of neurons in a human brain, now this would be kind of like getting, I don't know, a copy of Shakespeare's works, but you only get to see you know, every tenth word, or every, really, every thousandth word. Could you infer something more about what's going on um, because you understand the grammar, because you understand, you know, kind of the rules that these, that put these things together, um, and use that to better develop treatments? Right. Basic research underlies all of our advances in medicine. You can almost think of it as a, like an iceberg, and the tip of the iceberg is what clinicians can use in the, la in, the, in the hospital or in the office to treat a patient, but it's supported by this massive structure that you don't see, and that's all this sort of basic research that is being described. And so that's the importance of, of doing that. Thank you very much. Thank you.